Hi, everybody, and welcome to the second webinar in our virtual classroom series. In the first webinar, we talked about the release strategy and patching process for Oracle Database, and today we're going to tackle the upgrade itself. If you did miss that first webinar, remember that you can grab it and view the video on demand. We will take you from zero to hero on upgrades to Oracle Database 19C. We will cover the basics, all the details, and the little secret gems that you don't find anywhere else. In addition, we will have a strong focus on the auto upgrade tool and all its benefits. And in the next two hours, you will become a super expert in auto upgrade. I guarantee you, we guarantee you that the next database upgrade with auto upgrade will be the smoothest upgrade you have ever done. And if that wouldn't be enough, we'll be around to answer all your questions. So in the Q and A, we'll answer the questions and yeah, let's kick it off now. And let me start introducing Roy. So Roy is our vice president for database upgrades for utilities, which includes data pump, SQL loader, and for patching, which covers data patch. I worked for Roy for a very long time and we both cover customer projects all over the world. So working with Roy is great fun and traveling with Roy is even more fun. So Roy is based on the East Coast of the United States and he is with Oracle, I don't know, more than 25, 30 years? Oh, very long time actually. You can follow Roy on Twitter. You find his Twitter handle here on the slide. And now it's Roy's turn. You'll also be hearing today from Daniel Overby Hansen, our Senior Principal Product Manager for Cloud Migrations. Now, Daniel brings a very strong background as a production DBA to the table, and he spent many years working with customers in that regard. You can access Daniel's blog or reach him on Twitter, and increasingly you'll find that he's producing videos on the Oracle Database Upgrades and Migrations YouTube channel. And you'll find that those videos strike the perfect balance between being fun and interesting, but also having that relevant technical content that was the whole reason to view them in the first place. So now that you've met everybody, let's get started. This is Mike Dietrich, Distinguished Product Manager. Mike has been with Oracle for ages, and in his current position, he is the go-to guy for database upgrade and migrations. If you have a really tricky question that no one knows, rest assured that Mike knows. I strongly recommend that you follow his blog. It is a true treasure chest on everything that involves the Oracle database, not only upgrade and migrations. Here we are again. Today's topic, database upgrades. So everything from what you need to take care of before upgrade to how to configure auto upgrade, advanced topics, case by case situations, after upgrade. Unfortunately, we have a fully packed agenda. So I don't even know if we will make this in two hours, but we really try our best. And our focus is to give you the right information to complete your database upgrade successfully. Slides. In case you would like to have the slides, we already uploaded them to the upgrade block. So you will find the slides right now as PDF already on mikedietrichde.com slash slides. Go to web seminar 2021 and find the slides for today's seminar. The seminar will be recorded. So in case you have to leave earlier or you would like to share with your colleagues, the recording will be made available approximately a week after today's broadcast. Then you'll find the link on the upgrade blog as well, mikedietrichde.com slash videos. And you will receive also in addition a confirmation email for the seminar participation where you will find the link to the recording. Another organizational topic, if you want to ask questions, we are here to answer them. Please use always the Q&A. Don't use the chat. Functionality of Zoom, use the Q&A. We'll be around all the time and we'll be around also after the seminar to take all your questions. 
And no worries, you don't have to be glued to your desk for two hours. We do a five minute break in between. So five minutes after approximately an hour, and then you can refresh yourself, take a power nap, but wake up right on time for all the next topics we bring after the break. Let's go right into details, right into the upgrade topics. Enjoy. We went into a lot more depth about why you want to upgrade in our first webinar about release strategy and patching, but it bears repeating some of the key points right now, either if you haven't seen that first webinar or just to refresh you, even if you have. So first, where are we in the support lifecycle for the various database releases? Well, if you're on 11.2, 12.1, or 12.2, you're in a period of some type of extended support, whether it's limited error correction, their normal extended support, or market-driven support from ACS. If you're on 18C, you are fast approaching the end of error correction, after which point there will not be patches available. And that's one reason that 19C makes sense for your upgrade. And you might see 21C on this and say, well, wait a second, why am I going to 19C when there's something newer there? Well, the reason is that 19C is your long-term support release, whereas 21, similar to 18, is what we call an innovation release. Innovation releases are meant for customers who really need access to a certain set of the latest features. And here's a key point, you have to be willing to upgrade every couple of years to stay on innovation releases. So more often those are going to be deployed in your development uh, areas so that your developers can pick up new features like say the new binary JSON data type that's in 21. And maybe you'll plan on deploying that really in production once the next long-term release comes out. It's also worth noting for those who are in the habit of going to the terminal patch set of the dot two release, like if you were the 9208 to 10205 to 11204 type of customer, that's what 19C is. It is the terminal patch set of the 122 family. By going to 19C now, you'll have three more years of premier support, followed by three years of extended support if you either choose to pay for it or have a universal license agreement. Because upgrade is the kind of thing that customers often do only every few years, we've tried to make it conceptually simpler by breaking it into the four steps for a successful upgrade. It's pretty clear. First thing is to be on the right version of Oracle database. And the right version, well, that's what you're hearing about now. 19C will be the best upgrade uh, destination for now and probably for the next year or two for most customers. You learned how to download and install 19C in the first webinar, and you also learned step two, being on the latest release update and how to do that. So downloading and installing the latest release update, which at the time of this webinar is 19.10, is another key to having the best possible upgrade experience. Today's webinar is going to focus on phase three, which is using auto upgrade, the new tool that we've introduced. It's been around for, well, over a year now but it really implements Oracle recommended practice right there in the upgrade tool to relieve you of some of the burden of some of the say manual or documentation steps that you might otherwise need to go through. And then in a later webinar, we'll get to how to use other tools such as our diagnostic and tuning pack, which is very commonly licensed out there or other tools like real application testing, which maybe fewer customers have, but can be very helpful when you want to do workload testing, and even free features like SQL plan management to help obtain performance stability when you upgrade. So those are our four major steps to how to have a successful upgrade, and we've included them all in our quick start guide, which is available for download. Now, this might be the shortest technical brief that you can download from Oracle. It's only got two pages of content. Actually, the content is smaller than the boilerplate of preface and uh, title page and copyright page, but it is a very compact, easily digestible document that will give you those four steps with all the links you need to go into greater depth if you want to on any of those topics. So now that you have that quick recap out of the way, let me hand you off to Mike to talk about just the basics of what an upgrade is and why upgrades are different. Thank you, Roy. So what is a database upgrade and how long will my upgrade take? That is actually a question we receive quite often. 
that we can't tell you. I mean, we are the upgrade guys, but even we can't tell you. What we can tell you is that first of all, normally we don't touch your data. Whether you have 10 gigabytes or 180 terabytes in your database, it doesn't matter for the upgrade duration because upgrade happens in a dictionary. What mainly matters is how many components you have installed. So when you check DBA registry or CDB underscore registry, the more components you have, the longer the upgrade will run, simply for the fact the more scripts have to be executed. And unfortunately, component upgrades are not well parallelized. So when you look at the screenshot here on the slide, you see two examples, same database, same amount of data, 10 components, 52 minutes, six components, same database, 30 minutes. It's also a way to reduce the time to upgrade. If you're really going for the final minute, if you're hunting minutes, say, oh, we need to be under 30 minutes just to check whether components are used and maybe can be removed from the database. Also differentiator could be the number of objects in a data dictionary. When you take now an EBS database, an Oracle eBusiness Suite database, and you have like a million objects in the database, when we do changes to the dictionary or when we rebuild objects or when we change underlying partitioning layouts of dictionary tables, then it may make a difference. So on EBS database, typically an upgrade takes longer than a database where you have only like 200 tables and 600 indexes and maybe 10 stored procedures. Some feature version combinations can influence the upgrade duration as well. Just a typical example from the past, in the 11.2 days, the synopsis, the incremental stats collection in the dictionary in SysOx table space, first of all was unpartitioned, then with one release of 11.2, it got partitioned. And with the next upgrade, the partitioning layout changed. Now, you were not influenced if you never used incremental stats collection, but when you really use that, and for instance, one of my customers had already one terabyte of incremental stats synopsis in there, then the upgrade now is influenced because then the rebuild takes a bit longer. You can influence the upgrade also a little bit by more CPU power and more disk speed or faster disks, and also a little bit with SGA and PGA. I think Daniel had a nice blog post on that, how you can make a difference with different SGA sizes. In some cases, not always. And as I said, things which don't matter, the amount of data in your database. Also, there are exceptions like when we do a time zone change or when a text index needs to be rebuilt, that can have an influence as well. Removing components sometimes, if you're hunting for the final minute, that could make a difference. And you could go in and say, let me check if that component is really used. What if we remove it? So on the upgrade blog, you find a longer blog post series about how to clean up or remove components. And don't get me wrong. This is not saying, hey, please remove everything from your database, especially as some of the components may require to restart the database or never forget there are dependencies on components. So when you remove one piece, it may re automatically remove another piece as well. So you need to check carefully. But I tried to put the entire picture together on the upgrade block, how to remove components from the database if that is needed. Why upgrade is different? What do we do differently in the upgrade? First of all, when you upgrade a database, the database needs to be in startup upgrade mode. So even in a rock environment where you can patch rolling and the database itself is always up and running while the instances go up and down or down and up better in that order. When we do a database upgrade, so we change the first number of the release, let's say from 18 to 19, that is an upgrade. And then the database needs in startup upgrade mode. So it's restricted exclusive access and no application can run. What we do in the background here is we silence a lot of things. So here in that screenshot, you see a snippet from an old alert log. These days, you don't see these messages anymore. I think this was from 12.102, but later on, not from our perspective, but there was a fix made to hide some of the output in the alert log. And so you don't see them anymore. But what we do is, Cluster database needs to be false. 
no system triggers, no advanced queuing, no jobs run while the upgrade happens. So no worries. This is a question we get quite often. Do I have to stop my jobs when the database is in startup upgrade mode? No jobs, no automatic maintenance windows intervene with your upgrade. Uh, resource manager is not active while the database is upgrading. And unfortunately, also the AWR is not active. So it's a bit hard sometimes to diagnose performance misbehavior if there is any. And on the side, what we don't tell you in a documented way, externally visible is, we also suppress certain error messages because upgrade scripts are rerunnable, always. When the upgrade got stuck, when you had a failure, a problem, you had to stop the upgrade, you can always re-trigger the upgrade. And it doesn't start from the beginning, it just picks on, on the face where it's got stopped. But in order to make it rerunnable, and the same applies to database downgrade, by the way, we suppress certain error messages in dependency on the object where they are happening for. So it doesn't mean it's always flawless, but we know our candidates and we know what we don't want to show you to make the log files really a useful piece. Because otherwise, when an object already exists and you rerun the upgrade and you would get an error that that object already exists, that would make the upgrade logs completely unreadable and not useful anymore. So this is what we want to tell you here as a start. And now off to Daniel. Now that we've scratched the surface on upgrades, let's go a little deeper and talk about the parallel upgrade engine that was introduced in 12.1. When you upgrade a non-CDB database, the parallel upgrade will use a number of parallel processes to do the actual upgrade. The default is to use four parallel processes, but if you want, you can change it all the way up to eight. In the following example, I'll be using two parallel processes, which is similar to calling DB upgrade with the lowercase n option set to two. The upgrade itself is divided into a number of phases. Each of the phases contains a number of scripts. When you start the upgrade, the parallel processes or the workers will start to work on the scripts in phase number one. Common to all the phases are that the upgrade can't proceed to the next phase until all the scripts has completed in the current phase. So in a little while, when the two parallel processes are done in phase one, they will move on to phase number two. They'll start working on the scripts there and now that work one has completed on script one, it'll continue to script number three. Now worker two is done, but since there are no more scripts in this phase, it's idling. There's nothing more it can do. It's, it can't proceed to the next phase until all scripts in phase two has completed. In the next phase, there's only work for parallel process or worker number one, because there's only one script in this phase. It's a serial phase. So again, worker two is just sitting there and idling. So even though that you add more parallel processes to an upgrade, you might not see that it scales a linear because there are times when some of the parallel processes are idle. When you upgrade a container database, the parallel upgrade assigns a number of parallel processes that are used for the entire upgrade of all the containers. The default is your CPU count, but if you want, you can actually change the number all the way up to, well, it's actually unlimited. So you can actually overload your upgrade by using more parallel processes than you have CPUs in your system. In the following example, I'll be using a total of four parallel processes, which is similar to starting DB upgrade with the lowercase n option set to four. In addition to that, when the parallel upgrade engine has to upgrade each individual PDB, it'll take a number of parallel process from the overall count of parallel processes. How many parallel processes are assigned to one specific PDB? That's decided by the uppercase N option. And in my example, it's set to two. You can change it all the way up to eight, but you shouldn't expect it to scale linear because as you saw previously, in some of the phases, the workers can be idle. 
And when you start to add more workers, you will also start to see contention in the dictionary and in memory structures like the shared pool. So this means if you take the total amount of parallel processes that are available for the upgrade, and you divide that by the number of parallel processes that, that you use for one specific PDB, you know how many PDBs can be upgraded at the same time. So in this example, I have here a single tenant container database. I'm using a total of four parallel processes and two for each of the container databases. First, the parallel upgrade will start to work on CDB dollar root and none of the other PDBs. We have to upgrade root first. The upgrade of a container of a pluggable database is similar to the upgrade of a non-CDB database. There is a set of faces that contains a set of scripts. When the upgrade of CDB dollar root ha has been completed, the parallel upgrade will continue with PDB dollar seed and the user PDB. So this means that a non-CDB database upgrade is always faster than, this, than a single tenant upgrade. Because in a single tenant upgrade, you first have to upgrade CDB dollar root and then PDB dollar seed and the user PDB at the same time. Whereas in a non-CDB database upgrade, you only have that single dictionary to upgrade. When you look at a multi-tenant database, you have multiple PDBs. It's the same. First, we start out with CDB dollar root, and then we take PDB dollar seed and as many user PDBs as we are allowed to by the N parameters. And so the upgrade continues and it takes the next set of PDBs until it's all the way through and all the PDBs has been upgraded. The way you should scale your multi-tenant upgrade is by allowing more PDBs to be upgraded at the same time. If you scale your upgrade by allowing more parallel processors per PDB, you will see more workers being idle and you will see more contention in the dictionary and in the shared pool. So you scale by allowing more PDBs to be upgraded simultaneously. And I would recommend that you stick with the default two parallel processors per PDB. The last kind of upgrade that I would like to touch upon is unplug plug upgrade. You have your user PDB, which sits in an old release container database. You then create a new release container database, and it already has CDB dollar root and PDB dollar seed at the newer, higher level. So you unplug your container, your sorry, you unplug your pluggable database. You plug it into the higher release container database, and then you only have to upgrade the dictionary in that specific PDB. This means that an unplug plug upgrade is always faster than a non-CDB upgrade. Why is that? Well, when you upgrade a database, it's restarted multiple times. When you have to restart a non-CDB database, you have to stop all the background processes. You have to shut down the instance and release the memory. And then you have to restart the instance, start background processes, and so forth. But in a pluggable database, it's much faster to restart the database, and it typically takes only a few seconds. And in addition, the dictionary in a PDB is smaller than the dictionary in a non-CDB. And similar, an unplug plug upgrade is always faster than a single tenant or a multi-tenant upgrade because you only have to upgrade the dictionary in that specific PDB. You don't have to wait for CDB dollar root, PDB dollar seed, and any other user PDBs to be upgraded as well. Now that we've covered the basics around upgrade, Roy will take you through the next chapter, which is the things that you need to be concerned about before you start the upgrade. Thanks, Daniel. You know, despite all of the automation that you're going to hear about from auto upgrade, there are still some manual steps that you might want to take care of before you upgrade because they're mostly about the environment in which your upgrade takes place, your operating system, your server, your, your applications, for example. So let's take a look at some of those steps. First is to check the operating system certification. And you can do this by going to My Oracle Support. There's a certifications tab, and that's what you're seeing in this screenshot here. Check 
the versions of the operating system that your source database is supported on and the ones that your target database are supported on. In this case, for example, 11.204 and 19C. The reason that's important is that there may only be a very narrow intersection between the versions supported on source and target database versions. And that's really important when you're upgrading in place on the same server, because otherwise, let's say you're running Linux 6, for example, on 11.204. Well, when you look at 19C, you'll find that you need Linux 7. So you might have to plan an operating system upgrade in order to upgrade on the same hardware. Of course, if you're going to a new server, you could just install the correct versions on that new server and that takes care of it as part of your upgrade. But for in-place upgrades, find that sweet spot in the middle. The same is true for Windows as it is for Linux, where, for example, going again from 11.204 to 19C, what you'd need to do is make sure that your 11.204 database is running on Windows Server 2012 Release 2. That way you could upgrade directly to 19C on that hardware. If you want more details on uh, certification of Linux 8, then there are two articles on the upgrade blog that you might want to look at. Um, of course, Linux 8, by the way, is not certified with Oracle Database 11.204. So that's going to be one of those things that you have to manage. The next thing to think about is the version that you're upgrading from versus the one you're upgrading to. And is that release combination supported for a direct upgrade? In other words, a single upgrade from source to target. What you'll find is that 11.204 and later are supported for upgrade to 19C. And the reason for that is very simple. Those are the versions that were supported when 19C shipped. It also happens to be the minimum version that supports the same operating system that you can run with 19C. If you're running on an older version of the database, then you're going to find yourself needing to do something like using an alternative method like data pump or an intermediate migration. If all of this is getting confusing to you, please just consult the documentation. It's right there in the upgrade guide, the releases that are supported for direct upgrade to 19C, and also advice about what to do if you're on an older release. Now, if you're planning an intermediate upgrade, our advice is to go as far as you possibly can on that intermediate step to make the upgrade to 19C the smallest increment possible. What you're going to be doing in this case for that intermediate upgrade is managing that operating system and database relationship so that you can find maybe on a swing server the right combination where you can upgrade your older version to the, that intermediate release and then use that to upgrade to your eventual release on your eventual home. For example, 11.203 is still out there in common usage. Now it's important to note, 11.203 does not support Linux 7, yet Linux 7 is required, Linux 7 or higher for 19C. So what you would need to do in that case is come up with an intermediate environment say 18C on Linux 7 or Linux 6, where you could upgrade 11.203 and then upgrade from that to your eventual target server. The same could be true of 11.204 as an intermediate version. The next step, of course, before you upgrade to a new release, you have to install it. And there are just a few steps to installing Oracle Database now. Create the Oracle Home, download it, if you download, you're going to mostly find that it's a zip file right now, and then run the installer. What you're going to find if you have not uh, upgraded to a relatively recent version of Oracle Database is that the installer is a much lighter weight activity than it used to be. And that's because those zip files are now essentially gold images. So you're not doing all of the making and relinking and such that you might have needed to do with earlier releases. Now, while the installer is much lighter weight. It's mostly moving files around, setting up sim links and so on. There is still the root.sh at the end to set permissions and, and such. That does require root access. So if you have strict separation of responsibilities in your environment where only the sysadmins get root access and DBAs don't, you may have to plan that and do that handshake with your DBA to run that root.sh. You might have noticed on the download screen where Linux had not just a zip file, but also an RPM file listed as an option. And it is possible to download the RPM or use yum to install it. 
while that's possible and it might seem convenient, especially for those who are experienced with sysadmin more than DBA type of activities, the problem that I have with it is that it's still not a very flexible installation. For example, it always goes into the same directory, and that's probably not going to fit the naming conventions that you have in your environment. If it works for you, that's great. But for most people, the zip file is perfectly easy to use, and that is our general recommendation. On the application side, one thing to think about is whether to upgrade your Application Express or Apex component before you upgrade the database. And there are a couple of good reasons to think about this. First is that the Apex upgrade itself can be fairly time consuming because it often loads a lot of images into the database for new visual uh, styles and themes that you might want to apply to an application. Another reason is that Apex, the component, is really much more tied to the application than it is to the database. The version of Apex is only loosely coupled with the database, and you'll find that the versions that run with 19C will also run perfectly well with 11.204 database. And finally, that means that you can take the Apex upgrade out of the downtime window for your database upgrade. By upgrading Apex up front, you eliminate downtime, you take care of it from an application level instead of the database level. And a little uh, secret for you, in our next versions of Oracle Database, Apex is not even going to be included in the database distribution. It's really kind of its own thing there. You might want to think about speeding up your upgrade. The best way to do this is to have good dictionary statistics. Ideally, you should have dictionary statistics gathered the day before the upgrade. And in fact, auto upgrade will check for this and give you an automatic fix up if you haven't gathered them within at least the last week. This is the query that we use to find out when you've gathered dictionary stats, but it doesn't hurt to gather them yourself in advance. It's completely non-intrusive. It should be always a good thing to have the most up-to-date dictionary statistics. Uh, so if you can refresh those stats a day before the upgrade, that's our recommendation. And if you do it, then auto upgrade won't have to do it for you. If you don't do it, of course, auto upgrade will implement this. It is one of those best practices that we've automated for you. To give you a sense of how much it can save to gather dictionary statistics in advance, this is data that was gathered by Daniel on a uh, very highly consolidated environment with lots and lots of PDBs where the upgrade would take maybe about four hours in aggregate. In this case, on that, uh, that upgrade, gathering dictionary statistics saved 12 minutes. So that may not seem a lot when it's coming out of four hours, or it may be crucial to you to eliminate as much downtime as possible. That's why we always recommend gathering dictionary statistics up front. Finally, just take a look at the details of your operating system and the recommendations and certifications there, because we go into not just Linux 7, Linux 8, uh, you know, what SLES version for SUSE Linux, whatever. It's also down to things like the actual packages on Linux or maybe uh, the LPARs for, uh, for AIX, that kind of thing. So go check the operating system certifications in detail and make sure you have the recommended packages installed before you start the upgrade. And that way you don't have any last minute surprises when you start that upgrade and find that maybe a glibc version needs to be updated or something like that. So that's your preparation steps before using auto upgrade. Now we can really get into the meat of the subject and the details of what auto upgrade can do for you and how to use it. Thank you, Roy. Auto upgrade, the only recommended way to upgrade your databases. I emphasize only recommended way to upgrade your databases. And it's easy. Let's go. One, two, three. First of all, source releases. Your source can be 11.204, 12.102, 12.201, 18 or 19. And for the database itself, it typically doesn't matter on which patch level you are when you upgrade. They are very, very rare exceptions. Then you download the most recent version of the tool. Why download it? It's on my disk already, isn't it? Yeah, 
but I guarantee the number you download this minute is newer than the version on disk, for sure, because nobody has a faster release cycle than we do. We work closely together with a lot of customers all over the world. We fix sometimes things overnight, and every six to eight weeks, our development team releases a new version of our upgrade. And just in the unlikely event, not of loss of cabin pressure, but our upgrade making something not expected and not right, in this note, you find always the previous versions of auto upgrade when you scroll down to the bottom of the note. And you find also a change log. So we try to be as transparent as possible. We tell you what we fixed with that version of the tool and not only all the great new features, but we tell you about the features as well. So you download this file, which is a bit less in size than three megabytes, not gigabytes, not a typo here, just megabytes. You create a config file. This is the minimum version we need. It has the SID in the last line, the source and the target home, and that's it. Then you kick it off with deploy. So Java minus char, auto upgrade char. You pass on your config file, and then you say mode deploy. And this runs upgrade from analyze to prefix ups to upgrade to post upgrade steps. Of course, you can monitor. It's not a black box. We are command line guys, we are developers. We want you to tell everything the tool is doing in case we need that. But if you don't need that, the tool runs flawless start to end. And end means we can upgrade or auto upgrade can upgrade to 12.201 and 18. In both cases, you must apply to your target home upfront at least the January 2019 release update. Now, while we broadcast this, it's January or February 2021 already. So two years ago, I hope you have that at least in your home, but it's much better in our strict recommendation to upgrade to 19C. It will help you also upgrade to 21C once 21C is available. Auto upgrade can do that and any future release. So auto upgrade is available for non-CDB upgrades and CDB upgrades on all Oracle server supported operating systems. So if you have a database installation there, auto upgrade is supported and works even on Windows. Standard and enterprise edition, no problem here. Single instance and rock. And we upgrade from all supported versions from 11.204 or newer, and as I said before, 12.201, 18.5, 19.3 and newer, and soon also to 21. What you don't need and what you need, you need Java 8, so it's based on Java 8, which is part of the home since 12.102. At worst case, you need to install a newer Java version. Free megabyte char file, that's what you download. What you don't need, no agents, no enterprise manager, even though our enterprise manager team includes auto upgrade as well, as do other groups already like fleet patching, provisioning 21C version, which is useful for 19C upgrades as well, has auto upgrade now embedded as well. You don't need graphical tools, DVOA, not useful here. And this is, I think the most important part there's no extra license required. It's standard for everybody. So we don't charge you. Auto upgrade is a reaction to customers writing thousands of line of shell scripts. And we decided we take this task for you, for everybody. And we have really hundreds and thousands of customers out there who used auto upgrade already to upgrade their databases to 19C, in some rare cases also to older versions. Hmm. So what does auto upgrade do? You have the auto upgrade char and it has now, I showed you the deploy mode before, but it has different modes. So best practices that you run an analyze mode first. So you call auto upgrade with the config file and then with minus analyze. And when you do that, it writes a HTML file and you scan that HTML file. It writes also a lock, of course. You don't have to scan the HTML, but it's easier for our eyes to just go through the HTML file. If all is good, then you run auto upgrade. 
in fix-ups if you do it step by step. So next step would be fix-ups, which now fixes everything what the analyze found. For instance, emptying the recycle bin, gathering dictionary statistics or fixed object statistics if you haven't done that seven days or closer to the upgrade before. And next step, if you do it step by step, would be upgrade. Upgrade would now run also the database upgrade. And of course, also the post upgrade actions. But all this can be done with one command, as I showed you before, deploy does everything. So what is the best practice? Best practices, you run analyze, out upgrade char, config minus mode analyze, then you check the HTML or the log file, and then you run out upgrade minus deploy, and that upgrades the database. That's it. So two calls, one check in between, just to be on the safe side, and then you kick it off. If you want to experiment, if you want to start with auto upgrade because you never touched it before, easy starting is go to the upgrade block, just search for auto upgrade, and you find that old blog post with a list of uh, branching blog posts, how to diagnose issues, what the different modes mean, uh, examples for config files, and so on and so on. And Daniel will now explain you more about auto upgrade essentials. Thanks, Mike, for that quick introduction to auto upgrade. Now it's time to see how it actually works. And we have a demo coming up shortly. First, as Mike mentioned, you can download auto upgrade from my Oracle support. And I really encourage you to always download and use the latest version of auto upgrade. You can use auto upgrade minus version to see which version of auto upgrade that you're using. And you can compare that with the information from the My Oracle support article and compare the two numbers to ensure that you are running with the latest version. Once you've verified that, it's time to configure auto upgrade. It uses a simple text format configuration file and the simplest most possible file that you can create looks something like this. You have to specify the source and target Oracle homes and also the SID of the database that you want to upgrade. You can also create a sample configuration file. It has examples on how to use auto upgrade in more advanced scenarios and it lists all the details. Once we have the configuration file in place, it's time to analyze your database. Auto upgrade analyze is similar to running preupgrade.jar. When you run auto upgrade in analyze modes, it's strictly non-intrusive. Auto upgrade doesn't make any changes to the database. We only look inside to see what's required for this database to be ready to upgrade. So don't worry, you can run it on your production database even when it's in use. When the analyze completes, it's time to look at the summary report. If you look in the text formatted summary report, you will see something similar to this. The most important part is written in the bottom in red. In this specific case, there is no severe issue that prevents me from upgrading the database. It's ready to go. You can also look in the HTML formatted file and it'll look something similar to this. You can also here see that it's ready to be upgraded, no manual intervention required. And there's even a link to a pre-check report, which contains more details about your specific database. In the upper part, we have some general information about the database, including which components you have installed. Have a look at the list of components to see if there are some that you can remove before the upgrade. It'll make your upgrade run faster. Also, we have a list of all the containers in your database. If you have a non-CDB database, there'll obviously only be one, but we group the issues that auto upgrade finds by container and then by severity. You can also look at the details that I found by auto upgrade. We have elaborate description of what it actually means. And very important, we also list whether auto upgrade has an automatic fix up for this specific issue. If fix up available is yes, then there's no need to worry. Auto upgrade will ensure that this is handled before it starts the actual upgrade. 
The pre-upgrade report comes in various formats. I've shown you the HTML and log format, but we also have JSON files, which is very useful if you plan to use auto-upgrade in some sort of scripting or, for instance, via Ansible or another orchestration tool. Now that we've verified that our database is ready to be upgraded, let's go ahead. We use auto-upgrade in deploy mode. We use the same configuration file, and all you have to specify is mode deploy. This will start auto-upgrade in deploy mode. It'll reanalyze the database. It'll then run the pre-upgrade fix-ups and then kick off the upgrade. When that happens, simply just sit back and relax and let auto-upgrade do all the work for you. If you want, you can use the LSJ command to monitor all the jobs, all the upgrades that you have started to see how far they are. You can also get much more details about each individual upgrade. And if you use the status command, there is so much information that I have to put it into two pages. And for instance, in the bottom part, you can see uh, detailed information about the progress of each individual PDB. After a while, the upgrade job completes and you'll see a message like this. Then your database is upgraded and you can start to use it. Auto upgrade has also taken care of the required post upgrade tasks like PLC recompilation, time zone file upgrade and so forth. So super easy. And all it took was a configuration file and two commands. I've prepared a demo where we can see how easy you can do it. First, I'll show you my configuration file. It's a very simple one. It only has the source and target Oracle Home. And then I specify the database SID, DB12 in this case. Now I start auto upgrade. I specify the location of my configuration file. And first I analyze the database. I haven't specified a global logging directory, so AutoUpgrade chooses one for me. Now I use the LSJ command to see how far in the analyze AutoUpgrade is. Currently, one out of 79 checks remains. So job 100 completed. This is my analyze job. Let's have a look at the log files. I have here the HTML and the log format. And in addition to that, we have JSON and XML files that you can use. Let's have a look in the text formatted file. It has details information about each of the checks, for instance, dictionary statistics, and you can see that we have a fix up available. This means that auto upgrade will do it for you. Now, restart auto upgrade, but this time in deploy mode. Now, auto upgrade is actually doing the upgrade, so I'm speeding up a little. First, the fix up phase. Next, drain. This is where we shut down the database and prepare it to upgrade. And now we're in the DB upgrade phase. This is where the actual database upgrade takes place. And you can see how far auto upgrade is 61%. Use the status command and specify the job ID. You can see a stage summary how much did each phase take? You can find the location of all the log files. And I can see that it's currently at 61%. Now, after a while, job 101 completes. My database has been upgraded. I try to log into the database and check. Version full is nine, now 19.9. .9. Database has been upgraded and it's ready to use. So you see, that was very simple. A configuration file and two commands was all it took. If you prefer, you can also use environment variables to specify some of the input, so you can start auto-upgrade in just one command. In addition to that, you can use auto-upgrade and the config values option to specify anything that you would put into your configuration file directly on the command line. So instead of having to write a configuration file and then refer to that, you can simply specify it in one long command line. Now that I've covered the basics, 
it's not over. There is so much more than auto upgrade can do. Roy, will you take it from here? Sure, thanks, Daniel. While Daniel showed you how easy auto upgrade can be, and of course we want it to be easy, we also know that there are going to be times when you need extra control or the ability to take care of other situations that are not just a very simple upgrade a database or upgrade a couple of databases. So let's take a look at some of those advanced options. First, and really kind of in the core DNA of auto upgrade is the ability to upgrade lots of databases at once. That's why auto upgrade was originally developed actually for our fusion apps environment in the cloud where we manage thousands of instances, actually well over 10,000 instances. And we're able to upgrade all of those instances in one weekend with just a very small number of DBAs using auto upgrade. And you might want to take advantage of that as well. So while it can be as simple as three lines in a config file for auto upgrade of one database, it's also pretty simple to have just three lines for each database that you want to upgrade on a server or cluster. You can separate them using those identifiers. Those identifiers like UPG1 can be anything you want. It could be DB1 or DB2, whatever that is. Put them all in one config file and we'll manage the rest. Now, if you have a lot of databases and you're especially running in a rack cluster, you might want to distribute those upgrades across multiple servers. We don't allow remote invocation of this uh, using the upgrade node parameter in your config file. But what you could do, especially in a cluster where you have shared storage, is have one config file in a central location. And then by specifying the nodes on which you want an upgrade to run, you just invoke auto upgrade once for each physical server, and then only the subset of databases specified in the config file for that server will be upgraded. The way you specify the upgrade node is to essentially include the output of the host name command from the operating system. And that's what you would use to limit the upgrades to only the databases on that specific server. You may want to, in fact, will often want to update parameters as part of your upgrade, either because there are new tuning parameters that you want to use in the new, uh, new version, or maybe obsolete parameters you want to get rid of because you're no longer using them. For example, we really would like you to no longer use secure case-sensitive logon to, to avoid using case-sensitive passwords when you go to new versions of the database. And maybe your security uh, processes or policies say that that should be removed if it's there in any database. You could do that by specifying that as the global delete after upgrade P file. If you say delete any instances of secure case sensitive logon, then it would happen in every database in your config file. On the other hand, you might have specific parameters that are needed for specific databases or applications. You can do that on a database by database basis as well. Oftentimes customers have specific scripts that they'd like to, to have executed at a particular point in the upgrade process, either before the whole thing starts or maybe for an individual database. You can do this again globally or at the individual database level, specifying a script that would run before or after the upgrade. On the global level, you might do something like just uh, have some tracking database that starts at the beginning of your maintenance window and shows you that these databases are in fact being upgraded. And maybe at the end, you might have scripts that are used to validate that the upgrade succeeded. On an individual database, again, you might have a script that gracefully shuts down your application and maybe afterwards another script that gracefully starts it up. Those are the kind of things you can do using shell scripts or on Windows, a batch script if you'd like to. And there's one other option that's really nice to have, which is the ability to have auto upgrade read the output of that script and decide whether to proceed. So you could have, for example, a script that determines whether your database is ready to upgrade and returns a status to auto upgrade in case, for example, you've got a, an application that's in the middle of an important batch job and you don't wanna shut down the database. Auto upgrade by default will create a guaranteed restore point as a fallback mechanism unless you're using um, standard edition SE2 on your database. But you can control that yourself in case you don't want to use a guaranteed restore point. 
That might be the case, for example, if you're running in no archive log mode and you can't uh, take a guaranteed restore point. So you could say restoration equals no as part of your config file. The other thing about guaranteed restore points is that we do not automatically drop that guaranteed restore point after the upgrade. We can, if you want us to, we can, uh, you can specify drop GRP after upgrade equals yes. And then if the upgrade is viewed as successful, in other words, it proceeds to the end without any errors and with all the components valid, then we would drop the guaranteed restore point in that case. But for most cases, we leave it around so that you have the opportunity to validate the upgrade, run a few queries, make sure everything's working properly before you open it up to users. Another thing you might want to do related to the uh, the init.or parameters, there is kind of a global switch for if you wanted to remove underscore parameters from your databases. This is going to be most useful if you're using auto upgrade in a situation where maybe you're not the active manager of that database and you don't know what all the people that run their databases are doing out there. Perhaps uh, as a global matter of policy, you just say, look, we remove underscore and undocumented parameters during upgrade. If you need to add them back in later, do that your own self. And you can do that with this remove underscore parameter switch. Sometimes uh, you want the least possible downtime for your upgrade and you're willing to let users into the up, uh, upgraded database even before you've recompiled invalid objects. There is a small segment of users of customers who will do that. For those customers, we put in a switch that says that we will not consider running UTLRP to be part of the database upgrade. It's still something that you want to do. Believe me, you want to make sure that all of your uh, invalid objects are recompiled as soon as possible after the upgrade. But in those cases where the minutes or sometimes tens of minutes to run UTLRP are really something that you don't want as part of the upgrade downtime, then you can defer that and run it yourself later. Another thing that you might want to defer if it's going to be time consuming is the time zone upgrade. Your new database home will support upgrade of your time zone version to at least version 31, or hopefully you've got the newest time zone version applied to that Oracle home. However, the way that time zone versions work is that uh, if you have time zone version, say 34 applied to your Oracle home, you can still run a database that's on time zone version 14 or 21, what have you, anything up to version 34 out of that same Oracle home. You may still need to upgrade your time zone version of your database if you've got a lot of timestamp with time zone data types, but that time zone upgrade can be time consuming which I guess is kind of a self-reference to time there. But if you wanna separate that out and do that at a later downtime window, for example, because time zone version upgrade does require a restart of the database, you can do that by turning off that default behavior. Uh, in a CDB, you might want to control the amount of parallel processes used to upgrade your pluggable databases. On the CDB route, we will always use the eight parallel threads to upgrade the CDB root. But then beyond that, the default for auto upgrade is to look at your CPU count and use that many total SQL processes to upgrade your PDBs and to use two for each pluggable database. We found that that's generally the best thing for performance when you're upgrading in a consolidated environment. However, you may either want to limit the number of SQL processes, perhaps because there are other databases running on that server, or expand it if you think you can push the limits and go actually higher than the CPU count. We found that sometimes that can actually provide better performance because uh, the upgrade is not always CPU bound. Some parts of it are IO bound, for example. So you can play around with that with these two switches, the dash little n or dash capital N for the total number of parallel processes or for the number of processes used per pluggable database. One note about that though, that doesn't currently work for a non-CDB, that's gonna be coming in a uh, very soon in an update for auto upgrade. Finally, let's talk about monitoring. We know that as much as you love automation and having manual work automated, you also want to know what's going on so that you can control it if you need to. And that is one of the maxims that auto upgrade has is that we want to make sure you don't lose any of the monitoring or logging capabilities that you're used to. Uh, 
Well, this is a really neat trick of using a Python simple HTTP server to monitor the database upgrade. And let me show you this in a demo. So this is a video showing how we're going to do an upgrade of three databases. So we'll use the deploy mode, which will run the entire upgrade end to end. So we've already done the analyze, and now we're going to upgrade those databases. And once we start it, yeah, it's pretty simple. We've got three databases being upgraded, and we're just in the preparation, preparation stage now. But maybe you as a DBA want to monitor the status. Now you can do that in our interactive command prompt here. You can just type status over and over if you want, but that could get tedious. And why not instead have an automatic version where you can get a nice graphical or well semi-graphical look at it that automatically upda updates itself periodically. And that's what we're going to do here. We're going to take advantage of this state.html file, which will be there for every auto upgrade run and use a built-in uh, Python simple HTTP server, in other words, a very lightweight web server, to look at that file. You go into your web browser, you access the state.html file, and you can see here it's reasonably nicely formatted. It's not super complicated, nothing flashy going on here, but it's a table where we have the status of all of the upgrades that you're executing, in this case, three of them. And you see it starts with the different phases. We do stagger the start of each one just a little bit so that they don't all step on each other at various parts of the upgrade. So we're starting with the DB upgrade on one, we're in the fix ups on another and the setup on the third. And then you see on the right, the details, the progress being reported for each of those upgrades. So as we go along, this file is updated about every 30 seconds. You'll see that upgrade progress creep along going, you know, 36, 49, 91%. And even once the upgrade is done, you'll see that status move along through the different stages of post-upgrade fix-ups, uh, post-upgrade compilation, and so on. So that's pretty useful. And it even extends to the conversion to PDB because remember auto upgrade will automate conversion to a PDB for you. So we'll show you when that finishes as well. I think this is a terrific little way to monitor that progress. And it was actually something that came along for free just because we wanted to provide that logging for you. You might've noticed in that demo that I used the command console for auto upgrade to get the status on first to list the jobs and then get the status of the specific upgrade jobs that were running before I went into that automated method of monitoring it. But there's a lot more you can do from that command console, not just get information, but control the process. You can stop or resume uh, an upgrade job. You can restore that guaranteed restore point, in which case with one command, we take care of everything needed to flashback, uh, go to the, your old Oracle home, open reset logs, and so on. And there are other capabilities provided as well. So that's one of the areas where, as I mentioned earlier, we want auto upgrade to be as easy to use as possible, but to still give you the control and information that you need. And another place we do that is in our logging. We provide a very robust log file structure in both text and JSON format. And the JSON is there both for the auto upgrade tool to use, but you could use this for anything even like Ansible, where you could do something as useful as say, having it give you a text message when one of your upgrades completes. That way you don't have to actually watch the window to look at the status. That could be pretty useful. So this is the overview of the advanced options. And you might say at this point, we've covered the theory of auto upgrade, but now let's talk about how to put it in practice. And Mike and Daniel will go through a couple of the use cases that might resonate with how you need to perform upgrades. Hey, Roy, wait a bit. It's time for a break. People need to relax a bit and refill their cups. So five minute break now. And in five minutes, we'll go on from here. Auto upgrade now on a case by case basis. And let us start with unplug plug upgrade. 
So the idea is, as you can see on the animated picture, we unplug a PDB, we plug it into a different CDB, and then we let it upgrade. So unplug the PDB, plug in, upgrade. This can be done with a single or with multiple PDBs. The idea is that it's, first of all, fast because we upgrade only PDBs and not the entire CDB with all PDBs, and it's very flexible. It requires that your receiving CDB, the green one here on the animated video, is compatible. So it can take the PDBs you unplug. You can't flashback, unfortunately. So consider if you need an extra safety net using refreshable PDBs, or consider to use the target PDB copy option so the source files stay in place and we create a copy of them. Let me show you this with a quick demo. For the demo, we use that config file here. So in the first line, this is the current CDB where my PDB is plugged in. The second line, the target CDB, is the receiving CDB. So I will unplug third line, only one PDB here, PDB1, and it will be plugged into CDB19 and then upgraded. And source and target home. So let us check here this demo. So a quick recap of the config file. So the SID here, CDB12102, the receiving CDB, target CDB is CDB2, only one PDB, but we can do this with multiple PDBs. Then we use comma separated list, very simple, and source and target home. This is all you need. It doesn't sound that complicated. So kick off auto upgrade with that config file in mode analyze. Now I recommended before to look at the HTML file, but at first we can have a look at the status log because the status log will tell us if all pre-checks have been passed successfully. So we go from 12.102 to 19, and this is the log directory in a detail, and this line is important, pre-check passed and no manual intervention needed. So let's kick off auto upgrade. Let's kick it off with deploy. And list the jobs. So I have here a job 103. It has just started upgrading my PDB. And I check now with status minus job 103, a bit more details. So the upgrade is now three minutes in progress. This is all the log directories and log files and the database or the PDB to be more precise has been upgraded to 6% at this point. And a little while later, now the upgrade is completed. PDB has been upgraded. That's it, all set. Let's check. So I log into my database and let us check V$ PDBs. You see, PDB1, read, write, bang. That's how simple as it is. This is why auto upgrade is the only recommended way to upgrade your databases. No other tool is as simple as auto upgrade. So recap, more than one PDB, of course we can do that simple comma separated list. Rename the PDB. It was called PDB1 when you started. Now you want a more meaningful name. No problem. Target PDB name. And now dot PDB1. So name from before, PDB1. New name, sales. Or copy the files on plugin. Target PDB copy option for PDB1, so PDB name again specified, because you can have different lines for different PDBs here. And file name convert PDB1 subdirectory to sales. These are the options. What are the limitations? We don't support this with data guard. This is not a limitation of auto upgrade. This is actually a limitation here in standby environments, which have some extra constraints. And right now we don't support this with TDE, but we are strongly working on the TDE support for unplug up, unplug plug upgrade as well. If you want to dig deeper, if you need step-by-step -step and 
access to the video as well, look at Daniel's blog. There you find the entire description of the process. So Daniel will go on now explaining how to upgrade with DataGuard as the next case. Next, we have auto upgrade and data guard. First, let's have a look at it from a conceptual point of view. This is a straightforward data guard environment. We have a primary database that's shipping redo to a standby database that applies it. And both of the databases are running on the old release. When we start our upgrade project, we first have to install new Oracle homes on both the primary and the standby host. And remember, you should always apply the recent most release update before you start the database upgrade. When we've done that, we can stop redo transfer to the standby database, cancel redo apply, and shut down the standby database. This ensures that we have the standby database ready in case we need to fall back without having made any changes. Now we restart the primary database in the new Oracle home and start the database upgrade. When that has happened and we've verified the new release, we are ready to go live. We can then restart the standby database in the new Oracle home, re-enable redo transfer and redo apply in the standby database, and it gets implicitly upgraded via the redo that comes from the primary database. If you have a data guard environment and you start an upgrade with auto upgrade, it'll automatically detect that this is a data guard setup. And it doesn't matter whether you configured your data guard environment manually or using the broker. Either way works fine for auto upgrade. Everything that has to happen on the primary database is taken care of by auto upgrade. Whereas you as a DBA has to take care of the standby database. I've prepared a demo where we can see how you can use auto upgrade on a data guard environment. My database is called prod and the two instances are called prod1 and prod2. First, let's see what we have to do before the upgrade. I'm connected to the primary host. I connect to DataGuard CLI to the primary database. And I use the show configuration command to see that prod1 is my primary, prod2 is my standby. Then I connect to the standby host. I connect to the standby database and I use v$ parameter to query for the location of the broker configuration files. And I generate commands so I can copy them out of the Oracle home and into a temporary location. Now I stop my standby database and I disable it just to be sure. Then I copy out the broker configuration files to a safe location. And now it's time to upgrade the database using auto upgrade. I'm connected to the primary host. This is my configuration file. It's very simple. It only has the SID of my database and the source and target Oracle home. I start auto upgrade, refer to my configuration file, and I use deploy mode. Here I'm speeding things up a little so we don't have to sit and wait for the entire upgrade. After a while, the job completes, the database has been upgraded. Auto upgrade tells me that I have to manually enable redo transport when I'm ready to do so. And it even gives me the broker command to do it. So let's see what we have to do on the standby host. First, I set some environment variables and I copy in my network files to the new Oracle home. Next is my SP file and password file. And finally, I take the broker configuration files and copy them into the new Oracle home. Now I can upgrade the database in clusterware. I tell GI to start the database from a new Oracle home. I ensure that it starts uh, in mount mode as a physical standby. I re-enable the database and finally I start it. The standby database will now start in mount mode. 
Now I can connect to the primary host. And I use DataGuard CLI to log into the primary database. I then re-enable Redo Transport. So Redo is sent from the primary database to the standby database. And then I use, and then I use the show configuration command. There is a warning. So let's have a look at the details of each of the databases. Prod1, my primary. It is sending Redo to the standby database and there are no errors. But when I look at the standby database, it reports a warning, there is apply lag. But this makes sense. We just started the standby database and it's just receiving redo from the primary database. So it's trying to keep up with all the redo that was generated on the primary database when we did the upgrade. As the upgrade now implicitly happens on the standby database, you'll see that the apply lag decreases until it eventually reaches zero. Now the standby database is fully in sync with the primary and everything is good. But let's just test it. I'm using the validate command to ensure that everything looks good. When I use it on the primary database, it reports ready for switchover. Then I check the standby database. It too reports ready for switchover. So let's try a switchover and see that it works. I'm speeding up here a little, but after a while, there it is, switchover completes, everything looks good. And using switchover to test your data guard setup is actually a quite good way because you will not be allowed to perform a switchover if there is something wrong. If the standby database hasn't caught up with the primary database, then you will not be allowed to perform a switchover. If you need more information for your reference, we've included in the slide deck a link to a blog post. And what I've shown you here is one way to do it. But if you ask the MMA folks, the maximum availability architecture people, they have an, another approach that they prefer. They are very concerned about downtime. So they want the they want you to be able to go live faster after the upgrade. This means that they recommend that you keep the standby database online during upgrade so that you can go live faster after the upgrade. In order to do this, you have to start the standby database in the new Oracle home before you do the upgrade. And you keep redo transport on and you keep redo apply on during the upgrade so the standby database is always fully in sync and you don't have to wait after the upgrade for the standby database to catch up. Whichever method you prefer, I would say is a matter of personal preference. Each method is good and fully supported. I will go on with the next case. And this is a very common case actually, auto upgrade to a new server. So in many projects we get involved, upgrade is often tied also to a hardware refresh. So you get new hardware as well. And even in these cases, of course, auto upgrade is extremely helpful. What you do in these cases, you run analyze and fix up on the source. So analyze checks your database fix ups step now fixes things like creating dictionary statistics. Then either you shut down and restore your database with the config files to the target server. And those include everything you need to operate a database. This part is not done by auto upgrade or in case you have a standby in place, you would shut down the production, you would activate your standby and then go on from there on the standby side. You would bring the restored or the standby database in startup upgrade mode, and then you kick off auto upgrade with minus mode upgrade. So on the source server, a very simple example here, left side of the slide, source server, 12 and 19 homes, database is called DB12. In this case, we run analyze and fix ups, then we shut down immediate. I copy all files for my database, including reader logs, control files, SP file, password file to the target server. On the target server, ideally you updated ETC or a tab already, you prepared network admin files, and then you do the startup upgrade. And this is now sort of, I wouldn't call it a secret, but uh, this is what we have to do. As auto upgrade expects source and target home. 
but neither on the production side, on the source, there's a target home, nor is there a source home on a target machine. We have to just put in a, I would call it a fake directory, or I put in usually TMP because that exists on my boxes. So source home TMP, even though there's no Oracle installed in TMP, of course, only the target home. So basically the tool requires that we have both parameters, source and target home, but you don't really um, need the homes there on the machine. The home is not there. And then I kick it off with minus mode upgrade and that's it. Another case, and I like that so much and I just came across this by accident. You can use auto upgrade also for plugin only. So it assumes that your database has been upgraded. The feature actually got not implemented by accident. Uh, my, our mates just split that part up because when they tested a lot with the plugin, what they didn't want to do is always an upgrade first. So they took an upgraded database and wanted to test many different scenarios when the database is upgraded. And this is where this mode comes from, but I like it so much. So my database is upgraded already. You used auto upgrade maybe, but now you want to plug in your 19C database. You plug in a non-CDB, that's a different from the unplug plug I showed you before. In this case, we have now a non-CDB and we plug in into an existing CDB, but without upgrading. So they both have already the same version. The config file has my source and target home identical here. Upgrade UPG1 SID is DB12. Now important, I need to specify the receiving CDB. So DB12 is a non-CDB, target CDB, which auto upgrade doesn't create. You have to create that by yourself. Is called here, in my case, CDB2. And now I kick off auto upgrade, auto upgrade, char, config file, minus mode, deploy. And it will take my non-CDB, plug it in, and run all the conversion steps for me. This is super cool and super useful in case you are already on 19C, but you would like to benefit from the three pluggable databases allowed with every license of an Oracle database server, but only 19C onwards. So as you've seen, there are about as many use cases for auto upgrade as you have use cases, but there could still be corner cases or other issues that arise that mean that you need to kind of improvise or use auto upgrade in different ways to address issues. So let's talk about that. The first of these is going to be the simple one. What happens if your auto upgrade session dies for some reason? In other words, you're running in an X term and your system crashes. You've lost your X term, you've lost your connection. What happens to that, uh, to that auto upgrade session? Well, the good news is that auto upgrade, just like command line upgrade, is fully resumable. And in fact, it's smart enough to resume where it left off without having to specify parameters or anything. So you can restart by simply issuing the very same command line. Because what we will do is we will go look at that config file, find what the status of that job was, and resume where we left off. So here's a very brief demo of doing exactly that. We start by running the upgrade. And uh, you see we're running the deploy, so it's going to just run the upgrade. So let's assume we've already done the analyze phase. And once we're in the upgrading phase, we see that we're at about 41% upgrade. Now, what happens if at this point our auto upgrade session gets killed for some reason? Now, this was sometime after 41%, but we're not sure exactly where that was, are we? We just run the same command again, and it notices that there was a previous execution using that same config file, figures out where it had stopped and picks up where it left off. So you don't even have to start at the beginning and waste all of that time in order to, to resume the session. Of course, it's going to be better if you don't even have to resume at all. And one way to do that is to use NoHup, which stands for no hang up. What this will do, and especially combined with the dash no console and the ampersand for a background process, that means that even if the user logs out or goes away, that process will still keep running. It's not going to hang up the session. Another way to do this would be to use a terminal multiplexer where you have multiple uh, operations happening in the same terminal window. Those will also be able to keep your session alive. 
And what if instead you've got a completely different situation here? What if a fix up fails and is somehow blocking you from proceeding when you know it should go forward? Or let's say you just don't want to take the time to run that check and that fix up because as far as you're concerned, it was a warning, but you're not going to deal with it or a recommendation that you don't want uh, the fix up applied. Well, what you would do there is you could run the analyze phase and that produces a checklist. As you can see here, it's under the pre-checks subdirectory for that database SID, and it will have the name underscore checklist.config as part of that checklist file. You can then edit that and you could change the run fix line for that particular uh, fix up to be no. And that would present, prevent that fix from running. But even more, as you see the pro tip at the bottom of the screen, if you set run fix to be skip, then not only will the fix up not run, but we won't bother running the check. And that therefore, if maybe the check is running into issues, you can prevent that particular pre-upgrade check from running. So that could be useful. You edit the checklist and then you can specify that checklist in your config file to be used instead of the default one that would get generated. So that allows you to override either checks or fix ups that you don't want to run. And once you have your checklist file modified and in place, all you have to do is run auto upgrade with a deploy option. And what it will happen is it'll read the config file, notice that you have your own checklist and it'll skip the things that you want to skip and execute all of the other fix ups normally. Okay. So, now let's take a look at a different case. What if you need to restart the whole upgrade process for some reason? Well, we give you ways to do that from the command line with auto upgrade using the dash restore parameter. And what this will do, you could uh, flash back the database to a guaranteed restore point using the command line interface for auto upgrade. But with a restore command, you could also revert a plugin operation. Let's say you're doing the unplug plugin upgrade that you heard about before and you say, well, you know what? I wanna go back to that original PDB. As long as you've used the copy as opposed to the no copy option when creating that new PDB, we can delete the new PDB and you can go back to that old PDB. We'll automate that for you. The same is true of a non-CDB to PDB conversion. We can actually delete the new PDB. You can go back to the non-CDB, either the upgraded one or even then flash back to the old one so multi-step process, as long as you've copied those data files. If you've used no copy when creating those PDBs, unfortunately, that would mean that there's nothing we can do in that case. Now, if you do revert manually, like say you do your upgrade and then you manually go back to the guaranteed restore point from before the upgrade, then you need a way to tell auto upgrade about that. And we do give you ways to do that as well. So one of those is the uh, auto upgrade clear recovery data parameter. You can do this for an individual job or for all of the jobs. So if you've just restored everything, you say clear recovery data, I want to start over. Now you could also clear the recovery data manually at the operating system level. But to me, that's extra work. I don't know why you would do that instead of using our command line to do it. And that way it it removes the ability, if you use the auto upgrade uh, command to do this, then it removes the possibility that you might make a manual error or miss a directory or something like that. Now, if you have security, often, as you know, even though security is there to make it harder for the bad guys, it also imposes a little extra work on the good guys. Right now, what works with auto upgrade and TDE in other words, you have your TDE wallet around, is if you have an auto login wallet, then your auto upgrade will go just fine for in-place upgrade. However, when you're going to a new container database, whether unplug plug or non-CDB to PDB, uh, then we don't support that yet. That is in the pipeline where we will support a key store for an external password store. We'll deal with things like prompting you for a key store password in the auto upgrade console. In other words, your job get to a certain point where we need that password, we'll prompt you for it. Or also supporting everything that's needed in a data guard or rack environment around TDE. So all of that is in the pipeline. It's just not there yet. Last thing about the real what if is what if you have a problem that means you need to submit an SR? What data is needed? 
What information can you provide that will make it as easy as possible for support to understand the situation and for development to fix any bugs if you, if you find any? Well, there's a parameter called zip, the dash zip parameter that will use your config file, find all the log directories and zip everything up into a nice package that contains everything except for the alert log that we would need to diagnose problems. So you take that package plus the alert log and upload that to your SR and that'll make things go much smoother in your interaction with support. Finally, there's the compatible parameter. Now, the compatible parameter does affect all these what if conditions because, for example, if you raise compatible, you can't restore that, you can't flash back to that guaranteed restore point anymore. So you do still need to think about when and how are you going to raise compatible. Our general recommendation is still raise it seven to 10 days after the upgrade. But if you need to do it, during the upgrade, like say you only get downtime once per year and you need to raise compatible, then you can do that with auto upgrade as well, even preserving the ability to flash back if something fails before the end of the upgrade. And the way you would do that is to have an after upgrade script that will raise compatible because what will happen is this after upgrade script won't execute unless the upgrade is successful. So instead of raising the compatible parameter in your new Oracle home and your init file, you do this as an after script. And then if something goes wrong during the upgrade, we could still flash back to the guaranteed restore point. So you would do this with a combination of a shell script that invokes a SQL script and that SQL script handles the actual update of the compatible parameter. Now, I don't wanna give you the impression that things always go wrong and you have to do any of that stuff. By and large, upgrades just sail through well. And here's a quote from a very knowledgeable DBA where they've been using auto upgrade for over a year and a half now for all of the upgrades. And well, okay, Daniel is someone we hired since then, as you've seen in this webinar, but this is where he was a production DBA. He was one of our beta testers for auto upgrade and they've used auto upgrade on hundreds of databases now twice in order to upgrade their production databases. This is their standard. So by and large, auto upgrades will sell, uh, sell through just fine. And once your upgrade is done, there may be a few things you wanna take care of. So I'll let Mike talk to you about that. Yes, upgraded. But we have a few treatments for you after upgrade. And the first one is very simple. Lower the retention for object statistics. Default, as you can see in the middle of the slide, 31 days. Have you ever restored user object statistics older than a week? I haven't. Reduce it to 10 days, monitor and read all the sysox occupants, how much space you can save with that. Time zone. Do you have to upgrade time zone, yes or no? By default, auto upgrade does it. So if you have timestamp with time zone data in your database, we recommend it. Otherwise, hmm, not sure if you really need that. You can run the time zone update scripts by yourself, but be aware, time zone can't be downgraded. What does that mean? Look at the table on that slide. Let's assume we upgrade the database from 12 to a one, time zone V26 to 19C time zone V32. We upgrade, all is good. A week after the upgrade, you would like to downgrade your database. You can downgrade the database, no problem, but you have to make sure that the time zone patch 32 is available and installed in your source home now, because otherwise the database can't be downgraded as time zone can't be downgraded. So source higher in this case, when you downgrade and to the version you're downgrading to must have the same time zone patch in the home before you trigger the downgrade. The time zone files with all the definitions will be in Oracle Home Oracle Zone Info. There you can find all the time zone files. But where do you find the patches? Where do you find down time zone patches? This is the most note, 4.12.6. 16.0.1, oh, 
scroll down it's it's a long oh my god it's a very long note so you scroll down a lot down until you find that table here with the time zone patches you click on a link you download the time zone patch for your release 19c 18c 12 201 whatever be aware time zone patches are not rock rolling installable so when you provide a new home, that's anyways, no problem. Do these steps beforehand. By default, auto upgrade adjust time zone, unless you say UPG one dot time zone UPG, no, but by default, yes. What happens now if you upgraded time zone already in your 12 to one database to 35 and you upgrade to 19C, which has only 32? No worries, auto upgrade detects that case and copies the necessary files to the 19C home over in order to allow you upgrading successfully. You can also trigger a time zone upgrade. Check script is important because it needs to check and uh, just like a pre-check window and then apply really changes the time zone version of your database. It restarts the database twice. First of all, in upgrade mode to change the dictionary and then afterwards, the regular data will be changed. And here it's sometimes when you, when you have really a lot of time zone data, it could be key to improve the performance of that change. To be very frank with you, the scripts are not super optimized. So one thing which could help is you change the parallel degree of the table. You may change it back afterwards, just take a note. So this allows multiple workers there. Or you change parallel degree policy to auto, that can help as well. Or you run DBMS DST directly. So you spread it out. You control which tables or materialized use will be upgraded. You can parallelize. So have several scripts with DBMS DST changes and run them at the same time on different objects. This is also a way when you are really in a critical situation, you need to change a lot of times on data. The script is not made for that right now. Purge statistics history, as I showed you before, that's helpful. Purge also the scheduler logs, that is helpful as well. And a few issues or workarounds we would like to highlight here. First of all, when the check script runs, the upg underscore check one, then it does a call find affected tables. And this by default does not run in parallel. So for instance, one of my customers called me and said, hey, Mike, it's running for 12 hours. I mean, we have a lot of data, but why is it going so slow and serial? Very simple. When you check the check script, this red part here, parallel equals true, which came in with 19C um, or 18C, not sure about that. It wasn't there in 12201, but 18, 19, it's there. You just add this parallel, true, and then it runs in parallel. In 1911, the April RU and in 21C, by default, the check script has that. Before, simple treatment makes it run much faster. Another, cha another change when the apply of actual time zone to your data is slow. In the apply script, a simple workaround will be to comment out, this is why the two dashes are in red, this all the sessions that underscore with subquery materialized. So comment this out, then things run faster. And fixed in 1911, the April one as well. And finally, a sneak preview into 21C, because the documentation promises online upgrade of time zone data. And you see it already, I put some uh, quotation marks around online. Yeah, it's online under certain circumstances. So first of all, there will be a new init order parameter in 21C, time zone version upgrade online true. So you have to set this to true. And in an ideal case, there are no or minimal locks. And it requires only one restart of the database, but hey, not only one, there's still a restart of the database required. So online, yeah. Luckily, not several restarts anymore, and no startup upgrade. Okay, that's a good part. So done as a consequence of a database upgrade, that's actually a good thing. Um, when DBMS DST 
database upgrade, upgrade database is used. Uh, time zone operation will be done online, now marked in red whenever possible. Otherwise, an exclusive lock will be acquired. Is it really online? It depends. So I wouldn't uh, take this as the super feature you have hoped for. Play with it once 21C is there in case you are interested. Another step you may take after upgrade is when you had used unified auditing in 12102, and this slide applies only when we upgraded from 12102, then you need to be, uh, you need to do a little bit of uh, clean out and transfer unified audit records with that call. If you're upgrading from 12.2 or from 18 to 19 or to 21, no worries about that. Applies only to 12.102 upgrades. And client connectivity. So everything which is under support right now, which is 12.201, 18, 19, and 21C is green. Yellow means that's under extended support, so 12.102 clients, and 11.2.0 uh, clients, all that should work safely against 19C. For 21C connection, you see an exclusion still may work or may not work. It's not supported anymore. So check this beforehand. Um, yeah, and that's it here. Now on with Daniel. <laughs>I have a few things to share, something that you should take care of. In database 19C, Oracle Multimedia is now de-supported and doesn't work anymore. The API for multimedia has been removed, but if you look in DBA registry or CDB registry, you'll still see that the component or DIM still exists. It'll be removed in a later upgrade. So even though the component exists, it doesn't in any way mean that you can still use multimedia. It has been de-supported and it can't be used. If you are not using multimedia anymore, I suggest that you remove it before the upgrade to save some downtime during the upgrade. The Oracle locator still exists and still works. Even though it used to rely on multimedia functionality, it's still fully supported. In addition, Streams has been de-supported as well. Oracle Golden Gate is the technology you should use for streaming with Oracle Database. Oracle Database Advanced Queuing is not deprecated and is fully supported in Database 19C. It used to rely on Streams, but it doesn't do so anymore, and it is fully supported in 19C. In addition, there is a change of behavior with the DBMS job package. In database 19C, the schema that has to submit jobs using DBMS jobs must now have the create job privileges. When you create jobs with DBMS job, the API still remains, but underneath the hood, the code has been changed so it's actually now using the scheduler. The old job functionality has been completely removed, but the API still exists and we maintained it for backwards compatibility. But we strongly recommend that you look into using the scheduler directly instead of relying on the old DBMS job API. When you create jobs with DBMS job, you'll see in the scheduler views that a corresponding entry is created there as well. But again, I would like to emphasize, start to use the scheduler instead. Not only is it the solution that we will maintain going forward, it is also a superior solution compared to DBMS job. We have some additional information about the change of behavior with DBMS job that we've included as a hidden slide in the slide deck. So if this concerns you, download it and look at the details. This also applies to the D support of multimedia. We have included some useful links as a hidden slide in the slide deck. In addition to that, we have to talk about gathering fixed object statistics. If you look in the upgrade guide, we have a very clear recommendation that tells you to gather fixed object statistics after the upgrade, but you have to do it 
after we've run a representative workload on your database, you should never run it directly after upgrade. Why is that, you might ask? Well, fixed object statistics are statistics on, on those memory structures that gets populated as you use the database. For instance, there is the X dollar view that corresponds to the buffer cache. Right after the upgrade, the database has been restarted multiple times, and the buffer cache might be a lot smaller and contain a lot fewer items than after you have run your huge workload. So in order to get accurate statistics, you should run fixed object statistics after you've run your workload. Now ask yourself, do you always remember this? Do you go back to your databases after a few days to gather fixed object statistics? Well, if not, DBMS scheduler to the rescue. What I would recommend is that you create a SQL script, which create a scheduler job that runs fixed object statistics in seven days. In addition, you create a shell script that uses catcon pl to execute your SQL script in all of your containers, all of your PDBs, including CDB dollar root. And then you tell auto upgrade to run that script after the upgrade has completed. So after the upgrade, auto upgrade will run your shell script, which runs catcon pl, which executes your SQL script, which creates a scheduler job that gets executed in seven days and takes care of gathering fixed object statistics in all of your databases. Now you might ask, is seven days from the upgrade the best time to gather fixed object statistics? No, probably not. You, with your knowledge of the workload in the database, probably know a better time. But I can tell you that gathering fixed object statistics in seven days is better than not gathering it at all or gathering it right after upgrade. So we talked a lot about auto upgrade today. I did some more talking just now about auto upgrade, but Mike, will you take us through some alternative upgrade options? Are there any upgrade alternatives? Any? Hmm. There may be rare cases where you should rely or you can rely on a command line upgrade. So command line upgrade means you download pre-upgrade char from MOS node 8845.22.1 and you execute it. Pre-upgrade char will now check your database, create pre and post fix-up scripts, but you have to execute everything by yourself. In 21C, pre-upgrade char is not available anymore. Then you generate in case you need the output with auto upgrade, auto upgrade char minus pre-upgrade target version, and it generates the correct output then. After you did the pre-steps, you run DB upgrade on the command line, which is a wrapper for cut CTLPL and runs everywhere in your environment. Don't forget the minus L option for logging. And also a good thing, if the upgrade had died before with another tool, then DB upgrade is often your savior with the minus uppercase R option, it can complete the upgrade. And this other tool, which we don't recommend is the DBA. And one of the reasons we don't recommend it is simply the fact that it's not fully resumable. So when the upgrade dies or when you got stuck, it's often very hard to diagnose issues with the logging of DBA. And when the GUI tool is not available anymore, then the upgrade is basically broken. Don't restore your database, go back a slide. DB upgrade can solve that situation. Then a sneak preview into migration to multi-tenant. Why did we add that here? First of all, to advertise our fourth session, multi-tenant, but also, you know that sentence already. I'm pretty certain the non-CDP architecture may not be available anymore in a release after 12 release two. 12 release two means 12 to 1, 18 and 19. So until 19C, you still have non-CDPs, no worries. But after 19C with 21C, there's no non-CDB architecture anymore. So we need a tool to migrate our databases and hey, guess which tool that is? Auto upgrade, of course. We upgrade the database. And then when you prepared the CDB in the middle of my slide, auto upgrade will plug in the no new PDB and then do all the conversion steps with non-CDB to PDB. .sql. We'll dig much more into that in the fourth seminar. 
The reason why you may consider this with 19C already is that since Oracle Database 19C, we have this special offer for you at no extra cost. Even with Standard Edition 2, you can have free user-created pluggable databases just as part of your standard database license set. So no extra here. And three is pretty cool because the PDB dollar seat doesn't count here. So it's really free user created PDBs. And with that information, we'll close down or I close down here. Um, let's do it together and give you a very cool goodbye. Congratulations. You are now officially an upgrade hero. We are really proud of the auto upgrade tool and we are sure that your next upgrade will be a walk in the park. Well, we really covered a lot today, but it's not over yet. We have a lot more to come for you in upcoming webinars on performance stability after the upgrade, alternative migration strategies, migrating to multi-tenant, optimizer secrets, and more. As usual, we will hang around in the chat for a little while to answer all your remaining questions. And of course, we hope to see you soon again. So tune in to our next seminar Take care and happy, happy and successful upgrading. Thank you.